when they first brought her to my bed and I just totally fell in love with her. You know, um, it had been six years since I had a child and so it was like, you know, even though I was on drugs, it was still, that's one of the best blessings I think a, a pup person can have, especially a woman, is to be introduced with her newborn baby. Me and her mom used drugs together. Even her whole nine months of carrying Nairi, she used up until the day she went in the hospital to have her. She didn't even want to go to the hospital. She wanted that crack more. So now you was born as a crack baby. What's up, y'all? I'm Nairi D. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, Nairi, Nairi is a, a upcoming entrepreneur. I am an author of my very first book, which is called Crack Baby. I am a mother of four beautiful little girls. I am also a veteran. I served in the Army for three and a half years. I am a storyteller. I am very vulnerable, authentic, and personal with everything I do. What made me decide to write a book was when I was serving in the Army and I was observing everything I did from the time when I was taking care of my babies, um, the struggles I had to endure while serving, and then I just was like, look, I'm just about to start writing. So I started writing. Um, writing went to um, going back down memory lane. Once I went down memory lane, that's what really inspired me to write my book because I did not know I went through that much. The day we went to get her out of the crack house, me and my mom, it was a horrible sight. Seeing the baby on the floor with nothing to eat, licking, I can't remember what it was she was eating or licking, she was licking it. And oh, we just grabbed her, and there was so many people in the crack house, so many people in this one little apartment. I think it was a one bedroom, and the house was full of people. And all you could do is just grab her and leave. There is no telling what what happened, because she was one, and how could we identify anything that happened to her? I was introduced to crack cocaine in 1986. I'm not no year sober. Um, well, I had a drink last week, so I, I count that as not being sober. So without I ain't doing nothing, that's when I'm sober. Addiction is a heartfelt uh, enemy. <laughs> I mean, any addiction is, especially my addiction. It was just an enemy to no end for me. It stemmed from some deep-rooted um, things of my past. And, um, and so when I did it, of course, I, um, I liked it because it took me out of me and I didn't have to be the person I am. I didn't have to be Melinda that grew up with that past. I could be anybody I wanted when I was high. And so I, I gravitated towards that more and more. Um, my, my um, pregnancy went well, you know, because um, I started, I stopped drinking. I did do that, but I, I continued to use. And then after about the third or fourth month, I stopped. But I did use in her first stages. Okay, Mom, I need to be real. You used all the way. Oh, did I? Oh, I quit drinking in the first stage. Okay. Yeah, I didn't feel. I I was really thinking I did. Yeah, it like, is what it is. You feel okay. 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 I know. Okay, so I stopped drinking in the first stage, but I used all the way up to the end. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking I was real, but I'm glad you brought that to my attention, cause I mean, and I'm. Whew. She was uh, withdrawn a lot, and I know it's due to my uh, addiction. 
and she really didn't want people looking at her. If they was looking at her, she was like, why are they looking at me? You know, I mean, she used to ask me things and she, she well, didn't work well with others. It causes her to have 55 moves. She like had seizures from her mom using crack. And when I had her, by me being on crack, I would blow smoke in the room and that would calm her down. Once she got a little older, the, the passing out stopped. I say when she got about five, there wasn't no more passing out. The passing out where she get angry, she would just automatically just limp, goes in a limp mode. Her eyes were going back of her head, and you literally had to shake her to bring her back. Well, I was using, so I probably was in rehab. I was in rehab quite a bit of the time, most of the time. Um, always trying to get it right, and that's what I've been doing most of my life, is trying to get it right with my drug use and it's concerned. 1988, that's when they started in Cleveland. Mothers that was addicted, they were taking their babies. So, the state has launched a controversial counteroffensive. 22-year-old Denise Gathers gave birth twice last year. Both infants tested positive for cocaine. In February, prosecutors in the coastal city of Fort Lauderdale, knowing that drug charges just wouldn't stick, charged Denise instead with child abuse. I'm not going to plead guilty to child abuse because I didn't abuse no child. This is not something to punish a person for. I think being addicted to crack cocaine is punishment enough. You don't have to send a person to prison for them to learn a lesson. In the most aggressive prosecution yet, two women in central Florida have been charged not just with child abuse, but with delivery of a controlled substance to a minor, their infant children. If convicted, the women face 30 years in jail and drug testing by the state for the rest of their childbearing years. But her mom just had made it. So now we was able to be with family members all. Her mom was here and there or whatever. But she had mood swings. She, anything would set her off. And we all knew it would be cause her, you know, where she was from, what she went through. Even me using, I tried to raise her when her mom wasn't there. My family helped me raise Nairi because I was, once I got introduced to crack, I was off and running. My dad was gone most of my life, okay? My mom was in and out, but he was like completely gone, okay? My dad had uh, to do 15 years in prison, okay? So from the times I was one and then I was 16 and a half when he got out, but then when he got out, he went right back in for 10 more years. Okay, a year after he got out when I was almost 17, he went right back in. We were at the VA, both of us are veterans. VA um, installation there in Brexville, Ohio. He was very handsome. Well, not was, he still is, but he's just older. Um, but he was very handsome to me. Uh, what a big booty. And he liked what he saw, no. But seriously, um, I like what I seen too, <laughs> but. So my dad is just now getting in the picture um, these last three years. Um, he's been in my life and I thank God that he's been back in my life. But I'm, I'm dealing with those emotions, right? I'm dealing with the emotions of me not trusting him right now. I, I, I'm dealing with the emotions of um, me not giving him my all. Now don't get me wrong, I want to give my dad my all, and I think he know. <laughs> I think he see my resentment, and I don't want to resent him, like. I always wanted my dad. Like, what little girl don't want their father in their life? You know what I'm saying? And I resent him unconsciously. I don't do it because I want to do it. I do it because I don't know how to accept him right now. And I know it's going to take some time. And I just hope he know that. Just give me some time. 
this hard. <laughs> it's hard. Oh man, don't it? I know I can't make up for lost time, but I just fit in where I can get in. You know, and that's when I first seen her, it was it was almost like magic. I started crying. But it, it turned around because I wasn't gonna let it fail. I wasn't gonna let it fail. I wasn't. What were some of the things you did to not let it fail? Stayed on her about school. Even when she dropped out, I made her go back. Even when she kept complaining about different things, always told her, keep going, keep going. Um, I think she probably went to three schools, three or four. I know she was in the exceptional school, I forget the name of it, but she didn't, she didn't stay long. Man, I couldn't tell you because I was incarcerated the majority of those years. I, I can just tell you one of, two that I know of, but. All right, so right now we're in front of Cleveland School of the Arts. Um, when I was in the fifth grade, I wanted to go to Cleveland School of the Arts because it was a school for kids that got talent. And since I had talent, I love singing. I was able to audition, and two weeks after I auditioned, they gave my mom a call and they said I was selected, which was a big deal for me because I felt like this school was the best school in the whole city. I feel like all the kids wanted to go to this school, even the kids that didn't even know they were talented, like they wanted to come here to Cleveland School of the Arts. And I, man, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I would have stayed, but I was, I, I just didn't have a good upbringing. I didn't. I wasn't in a, 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 a stable environment to stay here. And I, unfortunately, what happened was they had to kick me out of school because my grades dropped. And, and I had to think that had to do with my drug use as well, because she she was off. And she used to be in the little show wagon, the little singers. I was always trying to keep her in that, even though my addiction kept me from doing a lot that I could have done. They called my aunt, actually they called my mom, but since my mom went back to the streets, I was living with my aunt. So they had to call my mom, then my mom had to call my aunt, and they had to tell her that um, they had to let me go because my grades was dropping too much and I was missing too many classes. I was skipping school like every day. What made me not go to school anymore was when I started smoking and drinking and stuff. And I started being around my older cousins who was in high school and they were skipping school. So that really played a big part of me not wanting to go to school because my interest was in everything else other than what I was supposed to be doing, which was singing, which was doing my, yeah. <laughs> so it kind of just took it away basically. After I was told that I was not going to be able to go to the Cleveland School of the Arts no more, Everything went downhill from there. Like, I really stopped caring about stuff. Like, it really got bad, and I was really in the streets after that. I was just like, okay, whatever, oh well. And then that's when I went to Wilson Middle School. When I was going to this school, I was fucking, I didn't, I didn't, I was, I didn't care. You know what I'm saying? At this time, my mama went back to smoking dope. My father was in jail, so I just didn't, I feel like I was just out here, like, out here, I was just trying to live. You know what I'm saying, when I went to the school. So, it was more so of, I just started not giving a fuck, for real. When I went to the school, I just didn't care about nothing no more because I just felt like my life was hell anyway. So I started, the attention that I really needed from my mom and my dad, I couldn't get it from them. So I started getting attention in the streets and I started getting attention being bad and fighting and shit. So that was my attention. So I, my attention was, hey, if I don't get it from them, I'm about to be bad. Now, I didn't know why I was doing it at the time, but now I know not. That's why she had a lot of fighting, because you're going from one school to another, so when you go to one school to another, it you get a lot of fights, especially here in Cleveland. It's a lot of fights. You coming in, being the new girl, and it's a lot of fight, and her anger issues, so. When I turned 13 and I was at my Aunt Pam's house, um, and I left her house, at 13 because I wanted to be in the streets, right? I started selling drugs at 14, I was just in the streets. 
So um, I could have took that same path. Like I could have, I could have been just nothing. I could have just dedicated my whole life to selling dope. But I had twists and turns because I was around a lot of people and I was seeing how people was living. And I just knew in my mind, I didn't want to be like that. Even though I was doing that, I just felt like I wanted to be, I didn't want to be like that. And I think that's what made me take another route. So I met my kid's father living with my aunt. Okay, I was 20, no, I was 19 years old when I met my kid's father and I was living with my aunt. And um, he was the, the, the seller. <laughs> and he was also a weed oh, man. And I like to smoke sell, weed. He, sell, he was selling your aunt? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that wasn't in the book. <laughs> no. Because I felt like it wasn't in the book because I didn't want to spread his life. I didn't want his life to. I don't know if he agreed with that part, so I tried to make it like he was just my weed man, but he wasn't just my weed man. He was her drug dealer. <laughs> Me, myself, I was nervous. Very, very nervous with her and the girls there. I just always thought I was gonna get a phone call and say they was gonna wind up dead because of what he did. What, you know, his, his roll out in the streets, so. Yeah, he dealt with my mom too. Yeah. Strange, no resentment towards him for what he was doing? Mm -mm, Cause I dealt with her too. When I was selling drugs, I dealt to my mom. And um, yeah, it's crazy. Why would you serve your mom? Yeah. Money. And trying to make him happy. not knowing it was hurting your mom even more. But when you in love, love make you do crazy things. Because I used to get on her all the time about being with him. Like, nerd, I was very, very scared. Okay, so I met my children's father at my auntie house, okay? He was my weed man, okay? Then we just became real close, like, this dude had the ambition, he was like, his energy was amazing. And we just, we were just close. And then we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And then we were just inseparable. We had, we had our oldest daughter, Manaira. We had her, he went to jail. So he went to jail for three years. He come back home, go to jail again. So then that became a cycle for him. So when he finally got out and I was maturing while he was in. See, I wasn't that same girl he met all them years ago. I was becoming a woman. So he expected me to be that same girl that he met, but I was no longer her. It took her a while, cause she was in love. She was deeply in love with her baby daddy, husband. Did you know about him right away or was it something? No, I knew about him right away, of course. She was like, I'm good. I'm good, yes. What were some I even showed up to the wedding. We had to. Yes, because that's my baby. You know, and I didn't want that same lifestyle. Like, I was done with that. And we just couldn't get it together. We was always clashing. He wanted to be in the hood. I didn't want to be in the hood no more. So I think that's why I was, I was just done with the hood, the, the girls and the lies and all the craziness that came with it, the drama. And I filed for a divorce. And that's all she wrote. What were some of the alarming things that you saw happen in their relationship because I mean you know ultimately she ended up going to a woman's shelter the cheating the fighting the drugs and to a point where she just got tired she got tired of living that life with him Even though I had to move around so many times, I was a very unstable child, I do believe that that saved me because I was able to deal with a lot of different people from a different walks of life. And you know, I was with church people, right? The ones that's very religious and they had structure in their life and they had a plan, right? And then I was in the streets. So I met some cool, straight, hood, straight, real people, right? So I was able to gain from that characteristics. And then I was at the shelter. 
That's a whole nother thing, right? So I'm around all these women in the same boat as me, and I'm like, whoa, I gotta boss up. Living around the city of Cleveland saved me because I was able to gain from each person I was around. I didn't let it beat me down. I was like, I like that about her. I'm gonna take that with me. I like that about him. I'm gonna take that with me. Because I believe if I would have stayed with my mom consistently, I probably would have been my mom. I said, Ma, I think I want to go to the military. So, go for it. Don't worry about nothing, go for it. What made me decide to join the Army was when I was working for the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was just working at a coffee shop. I was just trying to live, okay? I was working at a coffee shop, and the people there was like, I think you should join the military. And then, of course, my mom was in the military, my dad was in the military, so that had something to do with it, too, unconsciously. But I was just going by what people were telling me. I think you should do it. I think you should do it. Then my big cousin, Nike, which is, that's my other angel. That's my girl. I love you so much. Um, she encouraged me to do it as well, and we just made it happen. Was there any... Was it a sense of relief at this point? Because yes, very, very. You all understand, while her being in the car with him and things that goes on in Cleveland, it was very dangerous. It's dangerous here. And in the drug game, it's very, very dangerous here. And they don't care about the kids. That's the whole point. They didn't care. They wouldn't give a damn who was in that car. I took a lot of tests, failed a lot of tests, but eventually I passed. And um, I just started making, I just wanted better. I just wanted to get out of Cleveland. It was so much going on. It's still so much going on. I just didn't want my kids to grow up like that. I didn't want them to grow up in an environment I was growing up in. And I just wanted better for my babies. So I decided to join the military. I joined and <sighs> successful. I was successful at it. Oh, I feel good about it. I tried, I encouraged her to go because I was in the military myself. Me, her mom, her, my brothers, uncle, whole, whole family full of military people. I'd rather seen her go to war than be here in that drug car. The honest God truth. I would rather see her in Iraq than be here in Cleveland in that car with him. You could sleep easier at night? I could sleep easier at night. Her fighting the war than her fighting the war here in Cleveland. Um, this is crazy, right? So in the book, it talks about my stepdad, which is my mom's husband, and now she's a widow because he's passed away. And he brought me to Decatur, Georgia when I was 16, or going on 16, one of the ages. And um, I just liked the whole environment, you know, um, the smell, the food people. I mean, it was just so different for me because I was always in Cleveland, so it was just new to me. And um, we end up going, coming back to Cleveland, and I said this. I said, if I ever get the chance to go to Georgia, I'm out. I'm, I'm going back. And when I uh, was on my way out of the military, I began to look for houses. And I'm like, I'm looking for a house in Georgia because that's where my stepdad brought me, and I said I was going back. So that's why. That's why I chose Georgia. The reason why she moved down here, because she wanted to see grass green, that's all. Because Texas yeah, didn't have no, just rocks. <laughs> that is so true and funny. Now, now my stepdad was the, 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 the main reason, right? But yes, I love greens. My daughter is right. She know me to the T. I love me some green. And we was in El Paso, Texas for three years and I could not stand it. Because that is a training installation where we always train, always was in the field, rocks, dirt, mud, whatever you call it. It wasn't no green, nothing. So I was I wanted some grass. And um, and my kids know that. And yes, and Georgia is full of green. I love it. It's my favorite color. And I just, I want to roll into some grass right now. Like, I'm so serious. I was so proud of her. I'm so proud of her. 
Um, you, you hear me? That baby went through so much. Even from baby to now, before she went into the service. I had to get it out the mud. Oh my goodness. Oh, 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 I had to get it out the mud. Not even knowing who I was. Not even knowing who I was. Call me Big Dipper, ain't no stopping me. Through highs and lows, I've been popping B. I had to get it out the mud. I had to get it out the mud. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I prayed because all my other brothers and sisters got five, six, seven, eight kids and all of them musicians, singers, all types of stuff. So when I, I found out that she can sing, it did my heart good because she's following on positive passages of her, you know, her ancestors. I feel like Nairi brings a different, a different type of style that is going to be refreshing to a lot of people if you're just from that era where you appreciate authenticity. I would say even from when we started thinking about how we were gonna lay out her project, just the fact that she already had the song, you know what I'm saying, in mind, and I'm trying to figure out, all right, it's, it's modern now, like it's a new era, and they're gonna want a different type of sound, but your message is so good, and her singing ability is so phenomenal, I had to figure out a way to kind of how to, how to coincide that. Choose brokenness when you have all the pieces to put you back together stronger than ever. What he did to you wasn't right. The things they said about you was a lie. Now it's time to use that pain, turn it around for your gain, and walk that path that God has for you. Tell your story, and make a difference, oh, somebody waiting on you to come through and looking up to you to tell your story, story. So our first challenge was getting her to sing the song to the tempo. And I only call it a challenge just for reference purposes. It wasn't challenging her at all. She absolutely killed it, like. See, when you look in the mirror, you don't see nobody but you. Now it's time to face those fears and wipe away those fears. You owe it to yourself. So just our singing to the tempo, I had three reference tracks, nothing but vocals. Nothing but vocals, period. No songs yet, nothing but a tempo. But people don't understand how good that is and how much you can work off just a tempo. My name is Tammy Mitchell. I'm a case manager here at Laura's Home. Um, we're a part of the city mission. Um, Laura's Home has um, women and children and single ladies. And what we do is just provide hope, help ladies get back on their feet, um, give them some tools to use so that when they leave programming, they're ready. I remember the day Nairi came and I could see the struggle and I could see that, you know, she was uncomfortable with being here, um, shameful, it was shameful, she was ashamed. But then I slowly began to see her change 
And what that comes from is really like a, a radical acceptance. Like this is my situation right now. Um, what is it that I need to do to make the changes that I need to make? And everybody doesn't get there, but she did. Just looking at y'all, I can't believe that I was sitting in those same chairs six years ago. When I came in Laura's home, I was pregnant with two kids. I was in a, a, a mental abuse relationship with my kids' father. I didn't know my, my left from my right. I couldn't think straight. I was lost. I was embarrassed. I felt ashamed because I had to come to the shelter with my kids. Um, I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from, you know. And when I got here, I had to make a decision. Either I was going to be in the program, I'm pretty sure some of y'all went through this, or still going through this decision. Either I, either I was going to be in the program, or I had to find a job and how. What I was wanted to express to the ladies is that she's our, our guest speaker, but she's you. She sat in these seats just like you did. She went to classes just like you did. And um, that's something as staff that we can't do. This is, yeah. This is exactly how it is, y'all. What was your, what, do you remember your room number? It was um, 240. <laughs> <laughs> There was so many times where I was so lost. You know, I would just sit on the bed and just shake my hand because I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know if I wanted to stay or go. But I thank God that I was able to stay because it changed my life. Right. And I just gave that part up. I said, you know what? I'm done. I need to help. And I joined the program. And the program is amazing. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm telling you. And my thing is, there were so many times where I wanted to leave. I remember packing my bags twice. Twice. Because <laughs> I didn't like the structure. I didn't like to be told what to do. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Not knowing that the structure that Laura Tom provides was helping me. It was helping me to get myself in order, helping me to be clean. But at that time, I didn't see that. So I want to encourage you ladies, if y'all are going through that state right now, look, Laura's home is the best. It may not feel like it, but like I always say, it's okay to feel because we all have feelings. Your feelings is not wrong. What you feel on the inside of you, it's, it's not wrong. But it's just how you process it. That's why I love DBT. Anyone of y'all taking DBT right now? And if I see you, um, and you've done, and you've experienced some of the things that you have, and, and you've pushed and pressed through, then that makes me feel like it's attainable. I can get it. I can do it. Um, bathroom. This was it. Me and my three babies was in here. I was pregnant. Two kids. Me and three babies. Then they give us a little bassinet for the babies because the baby can't sleep with you. So I had a bassinet by the bed. Yeah, it was real. This was it. Look, guys. The best thing for me was even though I was feeling those emotions, I reached out. I think us as women, we don't like to reach out to each other. We feel like somebody will talk about you. But with me, I reached out. I didn't care. I didn't care. I asked for help. Um, even with my case manager, Miss Tammy, I was so real. I was like, Miss Tammy, I need, I need prayer. I need help. I, I always saw the fight and the potential in her. She just didn't see it at the time. And I, when we would have conversations, I could tell that she would really be taking in some hard things, not commenting on it, not saying it, but thinking about it. And 
um, I knew that she would get it. And I, I'm just so excited for her. So I think what a lot of us, what we do is we kind of we suppress our feelings because we afraid of what people think about us. But it's not about what people think about you. It's about what God is doing in your life. You know? So again, the next thing I want to talk about is trust the process. Trust your process. It's okay. Trust what God is doing because I always say all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. God got a purpose for you. You may not see it right now, but He got a purpose for you. So trust that process. Let Him mold and shape for why you want you. The Nairi that came to Lure's home um, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. And the Nairi that spoke to the ladies today, um, yes, it's, it's the same person. However, some heart changes have been made and she's um, realized some things in her life and to be true. And and it's a great, great thing. When y'all leave here, it's just beginning. So stay in touch with as many women as possible because we need each other. Yeah. And a lot of times we we be like thinking we got it all together. No, you don't. Yeah. I don't got it all together. Yeah. I'm just a living testimony because I push through. I still struggle. Yeah. I still pop off and I have to be like, no, not read. <laughs> For real. Like I really have to get myself in order. Like I still struggle just like everybody else. It's just, I'm just walking in my purpose. So when you know what God has for you and what he wants you to do, it don't matter how broken you may feel, guess what? He still can use you. Yes. And he's still using me with my crazy self. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I just want to um, close out in prayer. Um, and again, thank you. Let's give her another I do feel like Nairi connected. I, I feel like it was a huge connection and the ladies, some of the ladies spoke with her after to say that they really appreciated her coming back here. I, I It was great. I feel like that it was perfect. Are you Ashley? <laughs> Hi, Ashley. Hello. You know what? I'm before I came here, I wanted, I, I, I asked Laura to and I said, I want y'all to choose a mother that been doing excellent, want good for her, her babies, and they chose you. And I want to bless you with this fact because I'm a single mother and I know it's tough sometimes and we need that nurturing from one another. So I want to nurture with a, a gift oh. basket made by me, personally made by me. And is that your book in there? It is. I was wondering like, where can I find her book nope, at? Nope, you don't gotta find it, yes. it's in here. Thank you. Yes ma'am. <laughs> so, um, I'll just, I, I got you um, some little, uh, what do you call it? The note things where you can write your journal on and you know if you need to do lists or however you want to utilize it. This is really good. I got you some pens. And I got you an Amazon card, girl. You know, as mothers, we love Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. You mind if I give you a hug? Yes. yes. Okay. I love her. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And when she finished speaking with the ladies, I, I couldn't. It, it's just like what I do my work for. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's what I do my work for for um, ladies that come and have done and do what she's doing. My name is Brandon, and Nairi's my cousin. My dad and her dad was brothers, you know. He was asked to, you know, kind of watch over Nairi as much as he can, so he would take her to all the family events in Toledo, and we would be in the car, and we would say, oh, when we get there, we gonna do this, we gonna do that, we gonna have fun this, we gonna have fun that. Sneak, sneak and go do this, sneak and go do that. So it was like, every time a family event come, I look forward to seeing her.
from a person that had felt like they had no life to a life that it's on this only beginning. It is. She has so much, so much to give. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, cause what is the Holy Spirit telling you right now? What's up? What's up? I need a word. I need a word. What's up? What is the Holy Spirit telling you? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. My name is Cedric Pardon. And I know Nairi because that's my cousin. So, you know, me and Nairi know each other from kids, kids, five, six years old. You know, I'm so thankful today. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I hope Missy is blessed for the people that did make it out, for the people that did come out and want to see you and support you. You know what I'm saying? I know how that is. Missy always been my supporter, no matter what I do. I mean, and she always had joy when it came to talking to me. And I can't say that for all my family. I've been through some stuff. And I know Missy been through some stuff. And we had a conversation. She sent me her first book. And I said, Missy. You gotta give it to him, bro. You gonna write a book? You gotta give it to him. Bro. Wow. Wow. And that's that's it from a sister. She said, I can't read no more. And I was there. Look. One thing I can tell you about Nairie is if Nairie loves you, she'll be very protective of you. One thing I remember about Nairie is no matter what. If she come over to my house, she be like, ain't nobody messing with my cousin. And, and it was crazy because she was a girl, and she was a little bit older than me, but I always felt protected, even though she was a girl. I was like, she got my back. Yeah, I remember that. I'm going to be like, cuz, can I come to your mansion, please? I'm ready to leave mine. Hey, 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 hey. I'm ready to leave mine for a minute. Can I come to yours? You know, so, you know, this just the beginning. I'm thankful I ain't seen my family together like this, you know, since I, really since I've been home. And that's, you know, going on four years. So, you know, this is a blessing. I told her, I said, you're going to bring us together. Whoever you bring, however many you bring, you know, it's some of us, we ain't seeing each other. It's people you would have thought I, I would have seen. I ain't seen some of these people in life. Y'all tell me, when last time y'all, that's not, last time y'all seen me, that when I seen y'all. <laughs> you know, so, so they know, you know what I'm saying? So for you to come, for you to come all the way from Atlanta to bring people together who I haven't seen in years, you got to understand, you should know then God is doing something special. He's already showing you what he's doing because you're already bringing people together that may not have spoke for another two or three years. I'm so excited. I'm gonna get out the way. I'm ready to get my book. I'm sowing a seed today. Sow a seed today. And do not think about what's going on next week because the seed you sow in the hurt, listen, listen, what it's gonna give you in return, this is God's chosen. She is God's blessed. And I'm thankful to be here today. I'm gonna let the show go on. Thank y'all. I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Here you go. Yeah. All right. I guess this is my time when I speak, but I think enough was said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know for real though. On some real live. I just want to say again. Look. I don't know how many times I'm gonna say thank y'all because y'all just don't know how much this means to me, for real. A lot of times, I still feel inadequate. You know, I'm coming from a place of inadequacy because of what I went through and because of what I'm still going through, you feel me? And I believe that struggles are created to make you and not break you. And I also believe that God uses Anybody he want to use, yes. first of all, yes. okay? It don't matter what you're doing, what you've been doing, where you're at. It, that doesn't matter. Because I always say, don't look at the messenger and look at God. Because at the end of the day, he is the one that gets the glory. And as I say again, I'm too crazy to be praised. 
I'm, I am for real, okay? I still struggle, and I just want y'all to know this too because God gave all of us a gift. Y'all may not know that gift. Some people may not know their purpose right now. That's okay, but you got a purpose. Yes, you do. And even though you may be struggling, I don't know if it's alcoholism. I don't know if it's drugs. I don't know what that struggle may be in your life. Do not let that struggle stop you from being used yes. by God. Yes. Yes. My book was originally supposed to be named Thrive on Mama. And I sent my cousin Cedric a little bit of that. <laughs> and I, cause I really, I have a heart for single mothers. So I wanted to do something for single mothers. And I asked my cousin Cedric, like, look, what do you think? He said, look, if you go come with a book, you need to come all the way with it. I did not want to hear that. <laughs> I was like, what you saying? I gotta go back. Like, he like, cuz, you got to do what you got to do. And when he told me those words, I had to go back. Because I was obedient to him because I know his relationship with the Lord. And I also know he's a three-time author. You know what I'm saying? He got three books. So he the one I really, you know, wanted some feedback from. And I'm glad I was obedient to his word. And I did what I had to do. I went in. And I just went hard. So again, I don't like to talk a long time because I get tongue twisted, so excuse me. But I love y'all so much. God bless all of y'all. Um, and I appreciate the love, for real. Real talk. Alright, let's turn up. Turn up! I would say that I'm very proud of you and that I wish, I pray, and I hope that your story is not finished, but it's just a door that is closing and you're opening a door to many more blessings. I really bless the sky is the limit. Uh, you can accomplish whatever, whatever you sell out to, whatever you give your all to, whatever you go all in with, you're going to be successful. And, uh, I would say keep doing it. Try your best and keep expressing yourself and keep moving on and don't stop. Don't quit. <laughs> I would, I would love to say to Nairi to continue on your journey. Um, I'm a cheerleader for you. I'm rooting for you. And I, I know that she'll go where she needs to go. And she'll speak to who she needs to speak to. She's my everything. She, you know, she's my, uh, besides being my offspring and my legacy, you know, she's it's my blood, man, you know. Oh wow, so you, you truly mean the world to me, Nairi. But you already know that. I mean, but I have had that addiction that kept me stunted. It stunted my growth, stunted my thinking, stunted my mother characters, just everything. But I love you truly, truly, truly to the earth's ends. I love you to the moon and back. What I always told her, baby, keep your head to the sky. Don't look, let nothing down you. Just keep looking forward, Nairi. Even her toughest days, I said, baby, keep your head up. And she like, she said, Auntie, I always think about what you tell me. She said, I just keep going. Keep going. You get negative. It does everywhere. She's used to that. You, you're used to people being negative, so that's not going to affect her. Because I always said, whatever negative, come positive. So that's not going to do She's good with that. I'm not worried about that. Any negative comments or anything, anybody have anything negative to say. She's good, and she's always going to be good. Look, if you had a rocky childhood, right? If you was a crack baby, right? If you was abused in any type of way, and you are finding yourself right now stuck and lost and depressed and don't know what to do, Look, I'm here to tell you, all things are possible, but it's up to you, though, to turn those struggles, you know, into the stepping stone. You gotta stand up within yourself and say, look, I ain't gonna let this beat me up. And a lot of times I fought. It was a lot of self-fought, you know, and don't point fingers. I used to point fingers a lot, and it got me nowhere. So that's my biggest encouragement. Don't point fingers at nobody, because when you point one, you got like three point back at you. So you don't want to be in that situation. Um, just do you, do you. Everybody is born with something special. You find that special and you go head on. Don't let nobody talk you out of nothing. Don't let nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Don't let nobody detour you from what you are passionate about. 
And that's it. Look, I was a whole crack baby, man. I am a crack baby. But guess what? I didn't let that beat me up. Um, um, just, just do you. Like that's that's my biggest thing. And and for my single mothers, hey. So all my single mothers out there, listen to me. Let them babies be your motivation. Don't let your babies make you feel like you can't do nothing because you a single mother. So what? So I yeah, yeah. Just let them babies. Love on them babies too, cause they weren't asked to be here, first of all. Them babies was not asked to be here. And then we wasn't asked to be single mothers. You ain't just lay down with your baby daddy and say, okay, thanks for the nut. Oop. <laughs> thanks for the seed. And you can go now. Like we ain't we ain't asked to be single mothers. So I feel your pain, I know your struggle, but I just want every single mother to know, man, you can do anything. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you're going through right now. What matters is how you're gonna finish. I had to boss up for my purpose. I had to boss up, it was worth it. My little baby's looking up to me. I had to show them coming from the streets. 80s baby, yeah crack baby. That's what made me 